Good afternoon and welcome to Bible Quest, the New York City, New Jersey Philly edition. I'm Jeff Smelser and I am not in my usual place. I'm out where I live in Lancaster County and we're getting whacked by a snowstorm. And uh, Joe Works is in his usual place. Good afternoon, Joe. I am, and we are also starting to get a snowstorm here, but uh, you're ahead of us, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I have been out shoveling snow, and um, if I'm lucky, my granddaughters will have it finished by the time this webcast is over. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, all right, Joe, uh, today we're going to continue in Genesis a little bit. We've been spending the last couple of weeks in Genesis, looked at the creation story and the first sin. Um, maybe today we'll lead into the flood story with a quick look at Genesis chapters four and five, the end of chapter four and chapter five. How does that sound? That'd be great. To our listeners or viewers, if you would like to participate, we'd be delighted to have your questions, comments. They can be questions or comments related to the flood story or on any other Bible topic. We'll be glad to take questions on various things. And uh, we'll spend a few minutes talking about Genesis, and then if we have other topics, we will turn to those. Uh, you can send us a, your comments by way of the Facebook page. Noah Andrews, our very adept webcast engineer, will get your comments to us, and then we can respond. Or you can use the Q&A tab in the Zoom app. So, Joe, here's the thing that, that I'd like to just run by you, and I, I don't know what your understanding of Genesis 4 and 5 are. I know there are different understandings of when we get into Genesis 6, the thing about the sons of God and the daughters of men and the resulting giants, um, and I have considered the different views. I'll run my view by you and the audience, and maybe some of you will uh, think differently. Um, but here's, here's what I'm thinking. If you look at Genesis chapter four, after, uh, Cain has killed Abel, there's this description of Cain's descendants. Did we get into this last week at all? I don't think we really talked about, uh, the, uh, 16 and following. Okay. So in the description of Cain's descendants, there's this brief description of Lamech and, it's not like Lamech is an important character in the rest of the Bible. In fact, he's never mentioned in the rest of the Bible. But, but the narrator takes time to tell us that Lamech had two wives. Of course, in the beginning, God said the two shall be one flesh, not three be one flesh, and not three be two fleshes, but one, two be one flesh. But he had two wives. And it turns out it does take time to tell us he was a rather arrogant fellow. Uh, in verse 23, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech. Just right off the bat, the, I, I'm not sure we want to talk to our wives that way, but, you know, it's hard to know the tone of voice. However, when you continue and see what he says, you can kind of read the tone of voice. He says, give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech 77-fold. Sounds a little prideful, arrogant, wouldn't you say? Vindictive? Absolutely, yeah. All right. And um, so uh, then we come on down in the text. And uh, or rather, a little bit earlier in the text, you have mention of his descendants. Liddy, can you close that door, please, right there? Thank you, uh, my granddaughter. Um, <laughs> so a little bit earlier in the text, it mentioned some of his uh, descendants who did accomplish some things, but nothing spiritual. Then in verse 25, Adam had relations with his wife again. She gave birth to a son named him Seth. And uh, they thought of him as being given in place of Abel, who was dead now. And Seth has a son named Enosh. And the, the chapter closes with this statement. Men began to call upon the name of the Lord. It looks like a contrast to me. Yeah, a, a couple of things about it. Um, one, this may just seem rather uh, obvious, but I don't think it always is. A lot of times we think of Adam and Eve having three sons, Cain, Abel, and Seth, but it certainly looks like Seth came along much later. Um, uh, and as we talked about last week, uh, as far as Cain's wife and so forth, um, we're probably talking about a number of children even between them, but Seth comes along to, to be this one after the murder uh, of Abel. Uh, in the next chapter, we get the descendants of Seth through Enosh. 
And we don't see any descriptions of the descendants where somebody stands out as being particularly arrogant, like Lamech did from the line of Cain. As a matter of fact, what we do see is mention of Enoch, who in verse 22 walked with God uh, 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah. And then in verse was not, for God took him. And in Hebrews chapter 11, I believe it's verse 5, it says, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. So it seems that Enoch was a godly man. Right. I don't know if that's where you're going with it, but just one observation that this helps me to, whatever kind of connections I can make in the story, it helps me to remember the story. So Lamech, at the end of chapter 4, he is the seventh generation from Adam, and He's this polygamist and murderer. And uh, Enoch is the seventh generation from Adam through Seth, who is this righteous man who walks with God. Um, Jude 14 even calls him a prophet. Um, and so just being able to contrast Lamech and Enoch seems to be seven generations, maybe a complete period of time, kind of an indication, I don't know. Um, but they, they certainly stand in contrast to one another. Interesting. I had not caught that they were both seven generations down. And then, of course, we come on further in the line from Seth, and we get to Noah, who's described as a blameless man. So it seems that, for some reason, chapters four and five give us a picture of two lineages, one from Cain, one from Seth, one where the notable characters where the notable characters who are mentioned are godly, not to say that in either case, that's without exception, but, but it does seem like a contrast. And then we get to chapter six and we read this. Verse one, now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful and they took them wives for themselves, whomever they chose. And then the next thing you know, the Lord sees that every thought of man is evil continually and God's going to destroy the earth. It looks to me, as if chapters four and five and the description of the two lineages are there to give us an understanding of how there were some good men and there were some wicked, but when there was an intermarriage between them, the result was the whole population of the earth became wicked, and so we have the situation that, that called for the flood where all men would be destroyed. That's my take on it. There are other interpretations, um, and you may have some thoughts one way or the other, Joe. Uh, yeah, I, I sort of take a, a different view on uh, at least some of this, and uh, particularly with the uh, description that's given later on in uh, the beginning of chapter 6 um, uh, of the giants in the day, and he comes back to this idea in chapter 6 and verse 4, um, uh, where the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the men who were of old men of renown. Um, it seems to me like there's something special about those men. Um, they were, they're identified as mighty men. We don't normally think of just because you have an ungodly person marrying a godly person that their children are going to have extra muscles. Um, <laughs> so, um, to me, there seems like there's something more significant. Uh, this is probably not a real popular view, but I, I do tie it in with a couple of passages in the New Testament, uh, 2 Peter 2, 4 along with uh, Jude, verse 6. Don't make a big deal out of it. I think that that's, to me, that seems like a very logical, or, or maybe not logical, it's a reasonable possibility um, that these are angels who have left their proper domain. Um, again, mentioned in Jude. He, hearing the different, uh, uh, as, as you stated, I'm sure you've heard the different views as well. Um, there's arguments for and against, and uh, really it's just a matter of trying to weigh them out and. The text doesn't give us a lot more detail. Um, we, do, we do have one passage in the Old Testament, of course, where we see the phrase sons of God used where it does seem to be about angels. Right, right. And so that, that, that would be... Sure, Satan was... I'm sorry? I was saying Job, the first chapter. I may not have as good an internet connection here, so there may be a time lag in what I'm saying here. But uh, yeah, Job, the uh, first chapter where Satan is walking among the sons of God. How does it say it there? Um, uh, yeah, I was looking. I was thinking that there was actually one more in the Psalms, but I, don't, I can't find it really quickly. Um, but yeah, in uh, Job 1, 
Um, uh, it came to pass, uh, let me see here. Um, da, da, da. Well, now I've lost the verse. Um, uh, verse 6, Job 1, 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, appears, it does. It appears to be a heavenly scene there. Um, so we usually assume those are angels. And so that, that would lend some support to the idea that the sons of God in chapter 6 are angels. So we're talking about two different views here. One is that in chapter 6, verse 2, the sons of God are angels. The other is that the sons of God are descendants of the more godly line of Seth, but they're just humans. And then, then if they're angels, then when they take for themselves wives of humans, then the Nephilim in verse 4 are thought of as being um, giants. Um, and the word does mean uh, something like giants or great men or men of renown. Uh, on the other hand, if we suppose the sons of God are the God are men from the godly line of Seth, and they're intermarrying with the ungodly daughters from Cain's line, uh, then the Nephilim could be understood not necessarily as giants, but as giants socially, giants in society, um, great men that way. The word Nephilim is used in the Old Testament for giants. There were giants in the Old Testament. We can think of some, right? Yep, yep. Goliath and his family. Yep. Sure. Um, are giants, and there are various other giants mentioned in, in the Bible. So those are, I guess, the two basic views. There are probably some other views. Um, and, and then First Peter chapter 3 and verses 19 and 20 kind of gets wrapped into this sometimes also. So those are the two views. But that gets us to, uh, one way or the other, the whole earth does become corrupt, and God is going to destroy mankind. So let's pick it up there in verse 5 of Genesis chapter 6. And maybe, uh, Joe, if you'd read down through verse uh, 8 for us and get us introduced to what's going on here. Sure. Uh, Genesis 6, 5 through 8. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things, and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, it's, uh, I think to a lot of people it's kind of unsettling that here God would create every, everything and he would create man and now he's just going to wipe mankind out. Um, but there are various reasons that we can understand. We probably don't understand all of the reasons, but there are various reasons that we can understand why God does this this way. There are a couple of lessons that come out of this in Genesis chapter 6. There's, and I'll just mention them and then we can discuss them. But one lesson is a foreshadowing of the idea of a purification that takes place, a washing. And the other is uh, the idea of a judgment when man is held accountable. And um, both of those ideas uh, are tied to the story of the flood in the New Testament. So maybe we'll take a minute just to see that there are some spiritual ideas being taught here. You want to tackle one of those? Um, well, one is uh, just recognizing that mankind uh, is making a mess of themselves. Uh, they have brought this sin upon the world uh, in uh, verse 5 by their own thoughts, by their own ways. We saw hints of that already in the story of Adam and Eve. We saw it in the story of Cain and Abel. Um, each time that man departs from God's will, uh, disaster is what follows. And, and in that God does bring this tremendous judgment where almost all mankind is destroyed, save for Noah and his family, um, that serves as a uh, foretaste of the judgment that's going to come at the end of time. And Peter uses this story this way in 2 Peter the third chapter. In 2 Peter the third chapter, when Peter is saying there are some who are going to say that um, the promise of the Lord's coming has failed. In verse 4, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For from the day that the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. When there are going to be some people saying, 
you know, I don't believe the Lord's coming. Everything just keeps on going along. Peter goes back to the flood to say, you know, no, everything hasn't always just kept on going along. There was a time once before when God brought mankind to judgment. And so Peter says it this way in verse 5, For this they willfully forget, that there were heavens from of old, and an earth compacted out of water, and amidst water, by the word of God, by which means the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. So that, that's our flood story. And then Peter says, but the heavens that now are and the earth by the same word have been stored up for fire, being reserved against the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. I think it does serve as a lesson for us so that we can, we can imagine, yes, there could be a time when God is going to hold all men accountable and he's going to destroy everything. He did it once before. So that's, that's one purpose this serves. And the other is we see the idea of purification. When there is sin and then there is a washing, um, the sin can be washed away. There's a New Testament passage that makes that connection to the flood, right? The thing of First Peter 3? Mm-hmm. Yeah, verses 20 and 21 uh, uh, in particular. Who formerly were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through the water, there is also an antitype which now saves us, namely baptism, not the removal of the filth of flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I don't think we have a story in Genesis 6 that paints a picture of a, um, I can't think of the word, uh, what's, what's the word, the adjective that describes someone who's capricious, well, that's one adjective, but just who on a, on a whim gets angry and flies off the handle and says, that's it, I'm going to destroy everything. There's a word for that. What's the word? I'm sure there is. Uh, <laughs> just uh, It's paying really close attention, should uh, text that into us. Yeah, yeah, help us out. But anyway, somebody might think, well, that's that's what we have here. No, that's not what we have here. We have a God who is bringing judgment upon the world, but he is also establishing a precedent here, some understanding that will be helpful for all future generations. Well, let's go on and look at the story of the flood then and the ark that is built and all of that. Let me just make one other observation. Uh, it's hard to know where to throw some of these verses in but just seeing the big picture of the flood in Genesis 6 through 9 um, and some connections there with uh, God condemning and God saving um, uh, and uh, the, the purification in 1 Peter 3. I also think it's kind of neat how when we think about one of the most famous messianic prophecies uh, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53. Mm -hmm. Uh, in referencing the, the what Christ was going to do to take away our sins, in the 54th chapter, as he's describing uh, this uh, this peace that comes to us and the, the joy that comes as a re, as a result of that, mm -hmm. he calls our attention to the days of Noah in uh, in that in Isaiah 54 9. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth. So I have sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. So to me, it's a beautiful passage to think about God's saving, purifying of the earth and the saving of Noah and his family. It, Isaiah sees this through God's words. I think they're in Isaiah 54, 9. Uh, the, the, it, it serves as sort of a, a foreshadowing or Doy's word in the past, you know, a connection uh, to the, the story of Christ even. Yes, and I guess in Isaiah 54, um, it would be appropriate to look at that assurance of those who will know. I've forgotten what the word was now. Um, no longer forsaken, or how did it say it? Uh, I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. Okay, so that would be to the people of God who are going to ultimately be uh, saved in the Messiah. Yeah. So we go back to Genesis 6 and verse 9, and we have another one of these natural chapter divisions in the book of Genesis, where some translations say these are the records or these are the generations. Some This one says these are the records of the generations. Uh, what are some of the other expressions some of the translations use? But we saw one of these earlier in chapter 2 and verse 4, 
And um, now we get this one. Well, we had one in chapter five in verse one. This is the book of the generations of Adam. Now we have it again in chapter six and verse nine. So we're now moving on from the, the posterity of Adam and focusing on the, the line of descendants, although, of course, we're still talking about Noah and his descendants. We'll still be talking about people who are descendants of Adam. But we're moving on into the story of Noah and the flood himself. And it says he became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. And then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. What, what does your translation say there, Joe? In uh, verse 14, uh -huh. that same thing, make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark covered inside and outside with pitch. I don't know that we know what gopher wood is, but somebody was reading from one translation recently, and it said cypress wood, which would maybe make sense. Cypress surely holds up in water well. Um, but it goes on and says in verse 15, this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. What's a cubit? Let's throw that out to our questioners. Let's let our viewers, let's see if we can have a viewer translate this to feet. How many feet long would this make the ark? How many feet high would this make the ark? And how many feet wide would this make the ark? So if you're watching, see if you can tell us that. Verse 15 of chapter 6 gives it in cubits, 300 cubits long, 50 cubits uh, wide, and 30 cubits high. So maybe we'll see if we can get that. I know we've got some homeschoolers uh, that uh, you know are uh, are watching today, and uh, maybe some others who uh, are off because of the snow. So you know this should just be your math assignment as well. So, uh, oh, <laughs> we got an answer. I thought I, this this one's from Edwin. I thought he was giving us the length of the arc, and he says the distance from the tip of your finger to your elbow. And I say, wait, that, that's a little small. But what is he giving us? He's giving us what a cubit is, right? Right. Yes, your first question, yes. All right, good, and that's right. And he says, usually considered about a foot and a half. So that's right. So if we suppose if we suppose a foot and a half for a cubit, then Drew DeGrotto has done the math, and he tells us that the length, if it's 300 cubits, then that would be 450 feet, and if it's 50 cubits wide, that'd be 75 feet wide. So let's, let's make that real. A football field is, uh, Angelo says he got it too. A football field is how long? A uh, hundred yards. hundred yards minus the end zones. So if you take a football field without the end zones and it's hundred yards, that'd be how many feet? 300. So if we've got a 450 foot long arc, that's one and a half times the length of a football field. A football field and half again, that would be the length. And then a football field is about 50 yards wide. So 50 yards wide would be 150 feet wide. And so the arc is 75 feet wide, which is correct. That'd be half the width of a football field. So you're, th you're thinking of something pretty long, but pretty narrow, kind of like a lot of ocean-going ships are shaped, the proportions. Although I don't know that we should think of the arc as having the nice contoured bow and stern and everything. Or did you say bow or bow? Bow, bow right? Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> Well, anyway, maybe it was more like a barge, who knows, but it was then 40, uh, 30 feet tall, or 30 cubits tall, which would be <clears throat> how tall? Uh, 45. There you go. <laughs> and, and you were even public school. And, <laughs> and so, uh, uh, 40, which would be, you know, we might think of a four and a half story building. So you start picturing something that's four and a half stories tall and half as wide as a football field, and you get the, the idea of how big the ark was. Well, he, he tells Noah to populate the ark, right? Is to uh, bring all the animals in and uh, uh, all the food and everything else that's necessary. Mm -hmm. um, everybody thinks he took two of each kind of animal on, but we come down to Genesis 7, and it says in verse 2, you shall take with you a very clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female. 
I think there's a little uncertainty whether by sevens means seven or seven pairs. Um, what's your understanding of that? I've always read it as seven pairs. And then I think because of that, I come back then and see it as two pairs of the other animals in order just to be consistent. Now that doesn't match any of the children's storybook pictures that we have. Okay, and our authority is the children's storybook's picture. <laughs> the picture. <laughs> um, uh, somebody comments, I read somewhere that these dimensions are perfect for seagoing cargo ships, but man didn't discover this until I think the 19th or 20th century. I forgot where I read that. Um, I don't know about that. I, it, it is, the proportions do seem similar to a lot of ocean going vessels, but even in ancient times, it seems ships tended to be long and narrow rather than square, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they were certainly able to, you know, think in Paul's day and so forth, they had seagoing uh, vessels that uh, managed quite well. So uh, on the other hand, the, the intent of this is not really so is not really to get somewhere. It's just to stay afloat. And right. Right out the right out the flood. Well, this gets us to an interesting question. Um, the clean animals and the unclean animals. <laughs> We haven't s seen anything said about clean and unclean animals prior to this that I'm aware of in the book of Genesis, have we? That's correct. That's right. In the book of, in the law of Moses, we do have a distinction between clean and unclean, and they could eat the clean animals, and they would use the clean animals for sacrifice. The unclean animals, they would not eat. So it makes sense that, and then Noah's going to offer a sacrifice as soon as he gets out of the ark at the end of the flood. It, which would be detrimental to the population of whatever animal he was sacrificing if there were only two of them and he sacrifices one of them. But it would kind of be the end of the line. Maybe maybe that's what happened to the dinosaurs. He sacrificed the dinosaur and there were only two. <laughs> but anyway, um, so uh, the, but the question is, where did the idea of clean and unclean come from? God has somewhere revealed that uh, to um, the patriarchs. Apparently so. We've already seen indications that God had spoken to man about things that we are not given a record of his speaking to them about. He, uh, Abel offered his sacrifice by faith back in Genesis chapter 4, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God or by the word of Christ, depending on the translation you're using. So apparently he had a word from God telling him about sacrificing, uh, even though we're not given it. So it, it's not it's not unlikely that there had been some instruction here about clean and unclean animals. Mm -hmm. We come on in the chapter and it tells us about Noah entering the ark. And it says in verse 11, in the 600 year of Noah's life in the second month on the 17th day of the month on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were opened. It's important to notice here, the, the water did not just come out of the sky. It also burst up from the ground. And when you have enough water to cover the earth and much of it is bursting up from the ground, you're talking about the kind of upheaval that would create a lot of sudden geological change. So when people look at geological formations, the Grand Canyon or whatever, and they try to reason as to how long ago creation was, and they say, well, this must have evolved gradually over many, many, many centuries at the same rate at which we see erosion taking place now. They are forgetting something, that there was a time when there was dramatic change to the, sh to the surface of the earth by waters bursting up out of the ground. And you only have to look at some modern uh, events, you know, with the platelets shifting and the tsunamis uh, over the, the last few years that have been recorded in India and other places. You know, you certainly see a, a, a massive change and, and very drastic, if you can just imagine that happening uh, to, to the whole world, then that would definitely explain some of the things that people are forced to, to come up with other explanations that reject the Bible. And then it gets to verse 12. It says, rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And so after 40 days and 40 nights, they came out of the ark, right? Uh, no, they're going to be there for quite a while longer. I think that many of us, when we were young and we first heard the story of Noah and, Noah's and the ark and the flood, we, we understood it lasted for 40 days and 40 nights. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights, right. but they're going to be in the ark for over a year. Yeah, yeah. Even in verse 24, the water prevails for 150 days. 
which is half a year right there. Right. And so there's an interesting passage in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 1. God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. Uh, and God caused the wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. That idea of God remembering Noah, I, I don't believe that means God It was up in heaven and he goes, oh, no, I forgot about Noah down there in the ark. You know, sometimes like, oh, no, I left a pot on the stove with the burner on high. <laughs> Jeff, would, would, would you remember me in your prayers next week? Uh, I'm going to be going through some difficult times. And so... <laughs> We use that word in exactly the sense that it's used here. Yes, good. Um, Paul was asked by the brethren in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem to remember the poor when he was making his travels. Uh, various places we see that language. So God's remembering, Noah is an expression that tells us God took thought for and provided for. And specifically what is mentioned is that now the water is going to start subsiding. But I, I also suppose that it's not unreasonable to think that with all of those animals on there and you're wondering how in the world could they survive on the ark for over a year, uh, how would they eat and so forth. There's, there's some divine care here and God is providing for them. So as we come down in chapter two, uh, maybe read for us a little bit, Joe, starting in verse uh, two. Uh, chapter 8, chapter 8, verse 2. Yeah. Uh, the, f the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained, and the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of 150 days, the water decreased. Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. Of course, when it comes to rest... That doesn't mean that whatever land it's resting on is going to be exposed. You know, you, you can ground a ship even where the, the ground is covered by the water. It's just too shallow for the ship. And, and I don't know if there's an intentional play on the words here, but if I understand it right, the word rested here is, is basically the same idea as Noah's name. Noah's name means rest. God is going to, to be providing rest. As this ark is resting, uh, God is going to rest for Noah and his family as well. I think about how the God's people are, are compared to Noah in some of those passages, Hebrews 11, uh, 1 Peter, and so forth. God offering us rest by his grace as well. I hadn't caught that. I hadn't caught that play on the words there. I, I don't know for certain that it's intentional there, but at least it helps me to remember all that God is doing, you know, we, we talked about quickly there in Genesis 6, uh, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and then just thinking about the meaning of his name being rest, that's what God is granting. Verse 5 says, the water decreased steadily until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Then it came about at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made, and he sent out a raven. And it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. So she returned to him into the ark, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. Then he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. So he waited yet another seven days. And again, he sent out the dove from the ark. And the dove came to him toward evening. And behold, in her beak, was a freshly picked olive leaf, so Noah knew that the water was abated from the earth. Then he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, and she, but she did not return to him again. Now it came about in the 601st year, in the first month, on the first of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Then Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. And God spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your son's wives with you. So this is in the second month, 27th day of the 601st year of Noah's life. He, they had entered the ark in the 600th year of his life in the second month on the 17th day. So if I am thinking right, that means they were in the ark a year and 10 days. Have I got that right? Yep, that's what I, that's my calculation as well. 
So God says in chapter 8, verse 17, bring out with you every living thing of all, the, of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by their families from the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and he took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. I said facetiously, jokingly, maybe it was a dinosaur that he offered back earlier. I think a dinosaur would have been unclean, so that's not likely. Verse 21, uh, verse 21, and the Lord smelled the soothing aroma and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. So as long as God intends for the earth to remain, everything is going to continue, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, the seasons. There's going to come a time when God's going to say, okay, it's time for the earth not to remain. But while it remains, these things will continue. This gives me great comfort when I have so many people around me running around like chickens with their heads cut off. The sky is falling like the story of Chicken Little, talking about global warming or climate change and always trying to interpret whatever is happening now as evidence of, somebody's gonna say this snowstorm is a result of global warming. But they, there are people who really believe it is up to man to see to it that we don't lose our winters and summers or our, uh, our, our cold and heats that, it's up to us. It's not. It's up to God. And he said, it's going to remain. Yeah, uh, I think that's a good point. It, in fact, verse 22 almost sounds like this week in New Jersey. Um, uh, cold and winter and summer. Um, uh, you just didn't know it was going to be all in the same week. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if uh, if other people have seen this or this connection or not in this text, but to me, it's just really neat to see the patterns that develop from the very beginning of the Bible story, and I forget exactly where I saw all of this. I'm quite certain that it's not mine originally, um, but somebody described the story of Noah as the recreation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, have in Genesis 1 and in verse 2, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Here in Genesis 8 and in verse 1, it talks about how God made a wind. Well, the mm -hmm. word wind Spirit are the same, and you have the waters subsiding there also. Chapter 1 and verse 7, he talks about the waters were under the firmament, the waters which were above the firmament. It's about in Genesis 8 2, the fountains of the deep and the rain from heaven. Chapter 1 and verse 9, the waters under the I think that's together. Same thing in chapter 8 and verse 5. And you can just go through, there's a there's a long list of comparisons from the creation story in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 to uh, this recreation in chapters eight and nine. And it really, there, there's just a number of, of connections there. The language is so similar, it can't just be coincidence. I think you're right. I think it, that's the way we're supposed to look at this as a recreation. And then of course, Peter talks about, we have something to look forward to, a new heavens and a new earth, a, a recreation, so to speak, in Second Peter three. Right, yeah, and to me that, that, that helps with that language from Isaiah and, and from Peter of the new heavens and a new earth. That's, that's what God is giving mankind here in this story. Holly Green says that's a lot of water if it took a year to dry up, and that's right. Sometimes people have argued this was probably just a local flood. The Bible describes it as a worldwide flood. Just thinking about it, a year to dry up, we, we've seen some tremendous floods that are local floods, regional floods, you could even say, they don't take a year to dry up. So this is, this is quite a, an amazing thing. It's also significant, I think. People will take the same evidence and come to different conclusions, but when you look at other uh, ancient societies, uh, uh, cultures, uh, I, I won't say all of them, but many of them have a flood story uh, in them. And uh, they're not all exactly the same, but, but many of them have a flood story, um, you know, in, in their history. Uh, to me, it's just kind of interesting that this was something that was just 
accepted throughout all so many civilizations. I, I can't say all, but at least many. It does seem like around the world, many different places, people have a memory of a great flood going back in their earlier generations. Well, we're coming toward the end of the webcast. Let's throw out this question. We started off, we've gone through the flood story here uh, a bit. We started off talking about how chapters four and five lead into the flood story, and then whether in chapter six, the sons of God, the daughters of men is a description of angels cohabiting with um, with humans and uh, then the resulting giants, or if instead it's a description of godly men from the line of Seth intermarrying with ungodly women from the line of Cain, and the result being that there is a, uh, a wickedness that prevails upon the earth as everyone is influenced by the evil influence. Uh, maybe we could get just a, a response from those who are watching at this point. I'd be kind of curious which side of that everybody comes down on. So if you want to offer your thoughts real quickly, um, so you can either say angels or Cain's descendants. We'll just put it that way. Who do you believe the sons of, or the daughters? Hmm, that's not right. Sons of God, angels or Seth's descendants? Let's put it that way. So if you, if you viewers want to chime in here real quickly and tell us whether you believe it's angels or if it's Seth's descendants that took to themselves the daughters of men in, in Genesis chapter 6. We've got a question. Are angels capable of marriage relationships? Certainly not in heaven. In Matthew, the 22nd chapter, Jesus says that uh, in the resurrection will be as angels, neither marrying nor giving given in marriage. Right. Uh, and, and so that, that's the point that... Uh, it could be made there from the text in uh, uh, Second Timothy. Um, uh, he talks about, or I'm sorry, no, it's the one in Jude. I'm going to get them too confused. Where he talks about the angels having left their uh, proper domain, they left their own habitation, um, uh, and so we do see angelic beings or, or spiritual beings taking on human form. Even Jesus did that. And so that would be the question. But yeah, uh, Jesus' statement in heaven, the angels won't do that. That would be the, the connection for those that would take the view that I do. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we're going to get anybody who's bold enough to go out on a limb and take one position <laughs> or the other. Um, well, let me, if I can throw out a question, Jeff, that uh, maybe you'd like to, to tackle. I, I've heard people reference the story in uh, with Noah and the ark and so forth and talk about how you know, uh, the ark represents the church. Do you have a thought about that that you would like to, to share? Well, the, the Bible never makes that connection, but I think that the, the problem with that idea is that then the church is viewed as a container, and if we get in it, then we're safe. And in the, in the New Testament, the church is the people who are saved. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter and verse 23, Jesus is the savior of the body. The body is what he saved. And what's the body? Well, Ephesians chapter one, verses 22 and 23 tell us the body is the church. So the church is those who are saved. It's not a container that people can get in and put their trust in that container. Yeah. Uh, if, if anything, the, it seems like Noah would uh, and, and his family would be more uh, parallel, if we can use that term, to, uh, to the church, to the saved, First Peter 3, um, uh, in, instead of the, uh, the ark itself. Well, we have two, two responses. One viewer says the sons of God are angels, maybe, and another viewer says they're Seth's descendants. So with that, I think we're going to have to leave it there. And we, Lord willing, will see you all next week. Thanks for watching Bible Quest, the New York City, New Jersey, Philly edition, where we are snowed in. Thanks. Have a good week. Thank you, Noah, our webcast engineer.